Hello, we are live. I'm opening my recording software. I just realized I forgot to do that. <sighs> so thank you everyone for your patience. My technology hopefully will continue to work throughout Come the on, like, duration. Don't even, don't even say it. Don't even say it. Like, <laughs> don't, like you exist in a technological chaos universe where yes. everything is being destroyed all the time. And yes. you can't trust anything. True. And to even hope or make these kinds of empty promises is ridiculous. Don't even, don't even do it. Don't even do it. Like, the universe will just laugh at you and go like, it's like, you know, the universe is trying to kill you. This is the way it's trying to kill you. It's is just trying to make me go mad. Just make you go mad in a world of technology that you love and yet betrays you turn it's yeah yeah it really does it really really does mm -hmm. yeah yeah i've never seen anybody with the kind of technological uh like you have gremlins who cause gremlins problems i'm really hard on equipment yeah but no like like unless you're like giving off some kind of electromagnetic pulse are you a walking are you Dr. Manhattan, are you a walking nuclear bomb? Is that I, what this is? I, I used to notice, and I know this is confirmation bias, but it used to feel like the streetlights went out directly when I mm -hmm. walked under them. Yeah. I'm that person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You are just caught sending out waves of chaos into the universe around you, and the universe is responding by destroying your technology around you. It's trying to put a bottle on your just destabilization of the very fabric of the cosmos. I hate everything. You should. You should. But the question is like, you know, like, are you like, is there some kind of destiny? Are you like the chosen one? If you can somehow make a computer work for longer than a couple of days, does that mean that you will bring humanity into a new place of peace and prosperity? Or like, are you, will you destroy the universe? If I, I feel like that's attempting. far more common. Yeah, is the universe trying to stop you from finally <laughs> being able to run some kind of code that compiles and causes a rift to open up and turn the entire planet into ice? Nine? I know what the problem is. I've been warring on the mice that are trying to understand why the answer is 42, and my war mm -hmm. on the mice is is ruining mm. it for everyone. So so the... the yeah. Yeah. Gotta, gotta be nice to those mice. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's, enough silliness. Let's get on with today's show. Okay. Now, today's episode, what number? 671. Good Lord. Okay. All right. Should I, uh, should I press records? Yeah. So just to warn people here, we've I've got an interview that i got to do at 930. So in about, I've got to get prepped. Stuff. So, so we've got a book out yeah. pretty quick right after we do this episode. So, so we we did Monday yesterday or Monday we did the sort of hanging out and giving the future and just chatting, and then uh, today we're just going to hammer out the episode and, and move on. So there you go. All right. Okay. So I've pressed all the records. Okay. I've also pressed record. Here we go. All right. Astronomy Cast episode six seventy one: The Consequences to Breaking Space Laws. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, your weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I, I am doing well. Happy, happy pink, happy pink side, happy dark side of the moon, Fraser. What? I don't understand. It's the 50th anniversary of Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the oh, Moon coming out and cool. having a sciency cover and a sciency name that have absolutely nothing to do with each other or the contents of the album. Mm -hmm. And is gibberish anyway, because there's no yes. Dark Side of the Moon. It's true. It's all true. Yeah. All of it. Um, so I've got something kind of serious to talk about that I just want to uh it's in, like normally i don't beg for money but i'm going yeah. to today and that is because the advertising market has cratered yeah over the last year so ad revenue on universe today is down 68 percent 
since what it was this time last year, while the yeah. traffic remains roughly the same. And this is, you know, we've seen all these layoffs at all the big tech companies. There is a fairly significant restructuring going on in the market. And yeah. so, you know, if it wasn't for the patrons, I would be starting to lay off people at universe today, but thanks to the patrons, I don't have to, I, I've been able to sort of keep going forward. I'm assuming we'll get through this and that things will change and, and recover, but it also just gives me so much hope that I can shift from having to worry about what the advertising market is going to be doing and always be sort of concerned this place where I have thousands of individual bosses, each of which yeah. uh, can are supporting us. So if you've been listening to this podcast and you want to support that we do the, the work we do here, definitely join our Patreon. But also if you want to support the work that Pamela and I do independently of that, yeah. you can support our individual patrons as well. And, you know, normally it's like, yeah, it's, you know, it's a nice to have, but definitely things have gotten tight and I couldn't do this without the patrons. And if you want to support independent space journalism, please join our Patreon. So mine is patreon.com slash universe today. Yours is what? CosmoQuest? Yeah, CosmoQuest X. Right. And then there's the one for Astronomy Cat to support the salaries of the people who work on this website. So yeah. uh, if you want to sort of cover all your bases, support all three. And any amount, doesn't matter, but it's really helpful. All right. Enough of that out of the way. Let's get on to this week's episode. Now, last week, we talked about the laws that govern space exploration. This week, the rubber hits the road. What are the consequences for actually breaking these rules? Are they really going to stop anyone? And we'll talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. And we're back. All right. Now, <laughs> you've queued up a bunch of lighthearted uh, <laughs> stories about people breaking space laws. It's so. I hadn't even thought, you know, like I didn't know of anybody deploying nuclear weapons in space. And apparently these are not the laws that have been broken. They are no. a little more uh, down to earth, pardon the pun. So right. let's talk about some of these. So so one of the, the more interesting rules is if you break the law in space for your own nation, what the heck happens? And if you just in general break the International Space Treaty in space, what happens? And it turns out your own country is responsible for you. And um, there, there have been two fascinating cases, uh, one involving U.S. tax law and the other involving banking. And <laughs> Break bank law from space? It it happens. It happens. So Jack Swaggart, uh, back in 1970, uh, was a last minute replacement on an Apollo mission. And uh, so this was Apollo 13. So this mission was bad from all sides of the mission. But before it went bad in the ways we normally talk about, Jack had this realization that he left for space without filing his U.S. taxes. And as the story goes, he asked Mission Control, uh, have you guys completed your income tax? And there was laughter and um, there, there was a fair bit of asking the IRS for forgiveness and an extension because being in outer space happened being in right. outer space happened. So it really doesn't get any more lighthearted than that. The law was broken. No consequences were found. Everyone moved on with the situation. Now, I don't know how it works in the US, but here in Canada, if you fail to file your taxes on time, you get assessed a penalty. Yeah. So, so you're not going to jail. You just have to, uh, you pay a penalty interest for the late filing and increasingly insistent letters from the government but i can imagine in the case of an astronaut who you don't want a felony space, charge well it's not felony right it's a it's a it depends a, on how bad you do it well sure yeah i guess you know if, <laughs> if not only did he late file but also was embezzling and uh, <laughs> laundering money then uh and, and you know, misreporting his taxes, then yeah. perhaps he would be in a lot more trouble. But 
but in this case, I'm I'm as I guess he was lucky. He was able to talk away from having to do the fine and right, and, right, and pay interest, which is he just funny. got an extension. It's fine. It's yeah, fine. Yeah, he yeah, got an yeah. extension. Yeah. So less lighthearted and potentially could have had much higher consequences. Um, there was a NASA astronaut, uh, Anna McLean, who back in 2019 from the International Space Station was accessing bank accounts. It's what we do on the internet. That and other things. Um, the only thing was she was accessing bank accounts that were the bank accounts of her ex-wife. And that in general is not something one should be doing. And there were complaints filed. And again, no penalty was assessed. But the, these are cases of individual people breaking specific laws, investigations being done. And it's fairly cut and dry. If, if you break a law, you ask for forgiveness, and sometimes it happens. But these weren't space laws being broken. Right. These are Earth laws being broken. Yes. So have space laws been broken? Yes, all, all the time. Right. The, the most common one, as near as I can tell, is satellites launching and using entirely the wrong frequency, using an unregistered frequency, using a frequency that's just plain not supposed to be used. The most recent example of this is Skifty, which launched back, back in October. It was the fourth mission deployed by a Russian launch, and it is supposed to be the prototype for an upcoming uh, constellation of communication satellites, kind of the Russian version of Starlink. Initially, they couldn't find Skifty. Um, it just sometimes it's hard to find things right after they get deployed. But the kinds of people that go out looking for satellites were able to discover that on the orbit that it had that Russia had registered with the UN, there was a mission transmitting in the FM at a frequency that was not the one Skifty was supposed to be using. And it appears that that is indeed SCIFD. The Doppler shifting of the signal matches, the uh, orbit of the signal matches, and my dogs are just as upset about this as I am. Um, so this is something that happens. We saw with the Iridium satellites, they were transmitting back in the early 90s at a frequency very different from what was expected, and they were actually impacting radio astronomy. But it's up to your own nation to do something. And I don't think Russia is interested in doing anything mm. to Skiff D. Right, right. Well, I mean, if we've seen their, our experience with them in the past, yeah. uh, a, sort of another example. And like, you know, we talked about in the Outer Space Treaty that a big part of the treaty is all about not putting nuclear weapons in space. But several times rockets or satellites equipped with fission reactors have gone to space the same yeah. kinds of fission reactors that you would see on submarines aircraft carriers things like that and so one of the more famous examples is the cosmos 954 satellite which was launched by the soviet union in 1977 they actually ended up launching almost two dozen of these reconnaissance satellites with fission reactors on board US has also launched one as a test into yeah. space. But and so these things are still out there. Uh, like, are is that a nuclear weapon in space? Not exactly. But it's where... kind of a dirty weapon if you make it into one. Yeah, I guess so. And and so we see some consequences because Cosmos 954 uh, failed. Yeah, re entered the Earth's atmosphere and sprayed radioactive debris across a chunk of Canada's Yukon territory. And so, oh, sorry, Northwest Territory, Canada's Northwest Territory, near uh, some of the debris fell into the Great Slave Lake and other material, like fairly close to some towns in the Northwest Territories here in Canada. 
And so there's a giant chunk of the Northwest Territories, which is a bit of an exclusion zone, that there are warning signs if you try to go into that region. And Canada sent a bill, a cleanup bill, to Russia for $6 million and has is still waiting on full compensation to uh, to pay back for all of the cleanup effort that happened back in the 1970s. So you think that that's the kind of thing that the Outer Space Treaty would attempt to deal with. And you can see it doesn't really have any teeth. And, and this is the problem with a lot of international treaties, by which I mean all international treaties. <laughs> right, yeah. The, the only real penalties are you can be sanctioned, you can have your toys taken away, and you can have tariffs and other such penalties to commerce uh, inflicted upon you. But in general, there seems to be a desire to put keeping things moving forward ahead of punishing organizations and people for things that have already happened. I, SpaceX has actually uh, inadvertently become a really good example of this. Um, I would say quite purposefully became a good example of this actually. The, uh, the FAA denied them um, license to launch SN9, one of their Starship uh, prototypes that they flew to 41,000 feet and it came back and it exploded in a fiery mess when it got to the ground. And Starship was basically able to say, SpaceX was basically able to say, my bad, we won't do it again. Right. And Sorry, turtles. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. All right, we're going to talk about this some more, but it's time for a break. And we're back. Uh, so I guess there's another example that happened relatively recently. Did you see this story about a, an American company, that I guess, figured out a workaround to U.S. telecommunications law by launching out of India? Yeah, so, so this is one of those problems of... If your missions are tiny, the FCC and the FAA aren't entirely sure they can be well tracked. Once they're in orbit and they're giving off radio missions, it's the FCC's problem. And in this case, there, there were what's called space bees one, two, three, four that were meant to test out a company swarms idea for a space-based Internet of Things technology. And FCC was like, nope, we're not going to give you license for that. And a U.S. launch provider is generally not going to launch things that the FCC has failed to license. But India said, sure. And right. these we'll four... Yeah, these four little space bees went up with the Indian Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle and deployed. And the problem that FCC articulated is these are tiny. And when I say tiny, this is actually an exaggeration. They're like four inches, 10 centimeters cubes. And while it's possible to see things that size from the ground if they're shiny enough. You can only see them when they're in sunlight because sunlight, they don't exactly give off their own light. These things are in low Earth orbit, which means they're largely in the Earth's shadow. And if you don't get a quick orbital confirmation on them after they're deployed, they're going to wander off to whatever orbit they feel like before mm -hmm. you figure out where they are. And being able to see something that's 10 centimeters in size, four inches in size, and being able to initially find it easily are not the same thing. And so FCC was very legitimately concerned that once these things got up there, we wouldn't be able to confirm their position. We wouldn't be able to confirm their orbits. NORAD and the U.S. Space Force are out there updating orbits one to four times a day, depending on what the mission is. 
And you can't update the orbit for something you haven't initially found, which means these little space bees could not just sting other satellites, but collide violently into them. And mm -hmm. if the trajectories are perpendicular to one another or just at different enough velocities, this could create debris clouds and debris clouds are a bit problematic. Right. And so speaking of debris clouds, um, let's talk about something that like, I don't think it's covered in the Outer Space Treaty well, is clearly a problem. And this is anti satellite weapons. And, and this is one of those things where does it get covered by the uh, you're not supposed to commit war in space? Does it get covered by the you're responsible for damage done to other rockets? That one seems to be a clear cut. If you do something that damages somebody else's rockets, you hold liability. Mm -hmm. But back in November 2021, Russia, we're apparently going to keep returning to Russia, um, decided they wanted to test an anti-satellite anti weapon. And they weren't the first nation to do this. We can only hope they are the last nation to do this. The U.S. is guilty of this as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. U.S., China, and India have all tested anti-satellite weapons at this point. And Russia. And and the the spacecraft that Russia took out, Cosmos 1408, they have a lot of things named Cosmos. Yeah. Uh, Cosmos 1408, it was a defunct satellite, no longer in use, no longer usable, and in a low Earth orbit that caused the debris to actually intercept intersect the orbit of the International Space Station. The ISS has had to maneuver when the uh, anti-satellite weapons test first occurred. They actually sent the astronauts scrambling into the greater protection of the attached capsules. Um, it was kind of, and it kind of remains a hot mess because there's mm. this cloud of debris and it starts to raise a question of just how small can we detect and the smallest of particles can still cause great damage. And ironically, the Russians destroyed a satellite that has sent debris that has the potential to risk cosmonauts on the International Space Station. Yeah, yeah. Right? And <laughs> what were they thinking? I I don't know anymore. Yeah. I just And so at this point like the US has vowed to never do any more satellite tests and their anti-satellite tests and they're yeah. trying to get other nations to agree yes and so this is law that is in process right now and hopefully we will see a international agreement banning anti-satellite tests because obviously nobody needs more space junk and and they've demonstrated that this works i guess congratulations yeah. um all right we're going to talk about the future of violating space law in a second but it's time for another break and we're back. Now, there are people, uh, eccentric billionaires, who are planning to send vast numbers of human beings to red planets in our vicinity. And what are the consequences of that? How does that interact with space law? So, in theory. In theory. In theory. Mars, the moon, asteroids, they can't be claimed by any one nation for sole usage. Or eccentric billionaire, who is Correct. a who is the resident of a nation. Right. Right. Um, and and has multiple citizenships. Um, right. Yeah. So so the question becomes, at what point does it count as claiming something? There are companies that I really adore, planetary, planetary Resources is one of them, that are looking to figure out how do you go out and grab a space rock and use it for fun science and profit. Hmm. And Except when you go bankrupt and are acquired by I know. a 
right, by a cryptocurrency company? Anyway, I, it, yeah. It's all quite sad, but I... I There's when, no better way to lose money than to create an asteroid mining company. That is currently I can't true. Think of one. I, yep. That is currently true. Yes. Anyways, um, so not a lot of people are really argumentative about, yeah, if you go out and grab a small rock 500 meters across or something, just don't harm anyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, Japan literally bombed the bejesus with tiny robots out of right. a medium-sized asteroid. And an anti-tank weapon. And an anti-tank weapon. Uh, but where it becomes more questionable is when you start creating a company town on the moon, mm -hmm. not moon, on Mars. Um, and one of the ideas that we're seeing floated around is people will be able to go to Mars contingent on them agreeing to essentially pay off their debts through work. And the – I don't know if other countries had company towns, these – we, we actually, Edwardsville used to have mining and there's an entire section of our town that was was built and designed by a benevolent uh, company town where uh, people could go to the store that was owned by the coal mine and do their shopping there and it would be right. taken from their wages directly. Right. And you pay in the, co in the co company script and and yeah, like how could this go wrong? And, and so here you have to worry about human rights violations. You have to worry about slavery. You have to worry about just where are the boundaries and the rules? And on top of it, who enforces the rules? What nation does it belong to? Especially if we start having missions that are launching from international waters, because one of the parts that is not spoken really is the people who are enforcing the outer space treaty are supposed to be the nations launching the stuff and if it's not so much a nation that's launching the stuff what do you do mm -hmm. so i guess like if we were to put our lawyer hats on and examine elon musk and spacex's plans to build a city on mars yeah it would be treated as a research station yeah under the current law and the way the rules are anyone can use it yeah so but if he so controls there, the only means for getting there no 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 like this the, like just like if you were to like sit down and say like what does the outer space treaty say today that yeah. that effectively anything that that spacex will be building on mars is a is a research station it has to be a research station yeah. like you can't build you can't build anything research stations out in space and the rules are that you can't prevent other people from using your research station. You have to provide aid and assistance. You have to share your resources with people who make it to your station. And you can use parts of your environment to keep your station going, but there's no kind of rules about harvesting resources at scale, profiting off them, yeah. et cetera. Right. Yeah. And that any consequences for violating law would fall onto SpaceX as a company that operates in the United States. And in theory, other nations, if they have a problem with what SpaceX is doing, will put the boots to the US to make them enforce those laws to rein back what they're doing. But <clears throat> there is this saying that that uh, possession is nine tenths of the law. Mm hmm. So if SpaceX flies to Mars and just starts building a city, what can anyone do to stop them? If you can't stop them, then you can't do anything. And, and the thing that I, I feel like we just have to remember is we live in this weird world that, that is transitioning into companies are as powerful as nations and their headquarters can float from country to country based on who gives them the greatest freedoms, the greatest tax breaks. We see large amounts of Facebook stuff and things is out of Ireland because mm -hmm. that was beneficial. 
Um, so it it is easy to start to imagine a future where we've already heard Musk talking about if he couldn't get the clearances he needed to launch from Texas or Florida, he'd launch from a reconstructed oil rig platform. So in international waters. In international waters. Right. So we can start right. to move to the future of the billionaire in the ocean in international waters launching to another world and laying claims to a part of the territory. Yeah. So I think, you know, if people are worried that that Elon Musk and SpaceX are going to be able to just build a giant city on Mars and no one's going to mm. be able to stop them. I mean, I think that's ridiculous. giant city is a bit hard. No, that's yeah, not going to well, happen. I mean, you imagine the flows of material that we need to come together to support the creation maintenance of a giant city and every nation that is involved in the construction yeah. supply resource profiting off of this would be under various versions of international law and you would expect them to at some point decide that they're going to um uh say no and yeah and and so it would like if musk or sex or anybody right if Branson, who knows, wants to do what they want without any kind of consequences at all. They have to not be on Earth and be outside of the interaction of planet Earth. And, yeah. and that's impossible. You're, yeah. You've got to interact with Earth if you're going to try to do anything in space for the foreseeable future. And so I I just like, I can't imagine a situation where where anybody could do whatever they wanted in space and nobody on earth would be able to, to stop them. That's there, just... This I agree with completely where, mm -hmm. where my heart is, is slightly more bitter than my coffee is it feels like this is the kind of situation where you can imagine the, the equivalent of the old East Indian trading company sailing vessel with a couple of dozen people that are going to the new world and those people are essentially indentured to the company until they work off their debts. And and at that scale, I, I feel that we, we could see something happening that wouldn't be catastrophic to the red planet, wouldn't be at scale, but would still be kind of a high a human rights violation and but, and I'm not a, a fan of those. Yeah, but a human like a human rights violation is the kind of thing that is battled here on earth and so lawyers and would have a problem with time. this. Possibly. <laughs> but lawyers <laughs> would be concerned with this and there would be court cases and and there would be requirements set up. So I like yeah. I like as long as Mars needs a lifeline from Earth, and it's going to need one for yeah. decades, if not hundreds of years. The way you enforce what happens on Mars is you put laws here on Earth. And so I think, you know, right now the Outer Space Treaty falls well short of what we would need to be able to properly enforce, I think, yeah. our science, our sci fi vision of yeah. using the solar system. The laws need to catch. The Star Trek high sci-fi vision. There's plenty of sci-fi visions sure. that, that go yeah. the other direction. I think yeah. it's time for a reread of The Moon is a Harsh Mistress. I think I think we're reaching that point. Yeah, I, I don't think so. I think, you know, <laughs> seeing that that attempting to to run a mining company is a way to lose a lot of money. Yeah, fair, um, fair. We are a long way away from anybody being able to have the leverage to be independent in space. And so it's going to unfold in slow motion <laughs> and the laws in this case, I feel confident we'll be able to stay ahead of our expansion into the solar system. And I think the hope is that we continue to use the Antarctic Treaty yes. as and the Outer Space Treaty as a model for how to share this resource and try to minimize the tragedy tragedy of the comments that always seems to happen i hope we have your future all right we'll we'll find out together it's true. all right it's true. thanks Pamela. 
Thank you, Razor. And thank you so much to all the folks out there who are helping to make this show possible. As as Fraser mentioned at the beginning of the episode, we are here not just with Astronomy Cast, but with everything that is done at Universe Today and is done at CosmoQuest, thanks to the generous support of so many patrons. And this week, I would like to uh, thank a segment of our Astronomy Cast patrons, uh, David Gates, Philip Walker, Jim Schooler, Claudia Mastriani, Matthew Horstman, Alex Cohen, Kinsaya Pinflanco, Scott Cohen, D- Disastrina, Matthew Hayden, Justin Proctor, Tim Garrish, Gregory Singleton, Kenneth Ryan, Jeff Wilson, Tim McMacken, Cooper, Don Mondes, uh, Paul D. Disney, Omar Del Riviera, Aaron Zegrev, Benjamin Mailer, uh, Dean McDaniel, Ninja, Nick, uh, Michael Regan, Scott Briggs, uh, Michael Kalen, J. Alex Alexanderson, Benjamin Carrier, Matt Ruchter, Antiosaur, uh, Veronica Cure, Peter, Bruce Amazine, Father Prax, Jim McGeehan, Mark Stephen Raznak, uh, Frodo Tan- Tannenbow. I no, I didn't get that yet. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Abraham Cottrell, Philip Grand, Brent Kiernop, uh, share some, uh, David Ilk. Thank you all, all of you so very much for everything you do to make our shows possible. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you next week. <laughs> bye bye. And then and they, they saved. saved. <sighs> uh... Yvette Chambers, Natty Yvette Chambers is saying the tragedy of the comments isn't real. I, can you go into more detail on that? Because I like I feel like the tragedy of the commons is like happens all the time. Like we people ruin a shared resource. Yeah. I don't know. Is there some definition that I'm not aware of? Like, like I, I look around me at shared resources are getting ruined in real yeah. time. Yeah. In fact, the uh, logging company that owns the land all around us is in the process of clear cutting all of the trees around us. And so before you, as you tr- drove to our property, you sort of see this hill and it was just covered in trees. And now you can see through the trees to the light behind it, because in fact, they've left this thin little boundary of trees in between oh, us man. and the land. We a, a, a buddy of his drone and, and flew up and took a little peep over the uh, over the hill and it's yeah. just decimated, like just completely yeah. hacked down. They've left a couple of of older large trees that they have to, and I guess they're leaving a barrier between us so that we don't have to sort of see the top of the mountain get shorn away. Um, but it sucks. Yeah. Although now maybe they'll sell us the land. <laughs> they've yeah. stripped it yeah flying over the rockies and over appalachia both always just leave me sad and angry because you see these pit mines especially in the appalachia area you see the clear cut to run electricity from from forestry from so many different things and it's just like there's no moment from an airplane that you don't see the signs of human beings on the landscape. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, I live in a know, mostly often... empty country. You live in a more empty country, but right, yeah, yeah. You definitely, you definitely see it. But I mean, like, it, it's kind of amazing that I live in a mostly empty country, a gigantic country. Yeah, and and yet the there's almost no old growth stands of old growth forest left. Like yeah. it's you can measure it as a, as I forget what it is, like 1% or something like that. And so even though we have millions of square kilometers of forest, Mm -hmm. it's been harvested two, maybe three times over already. Like, like you walk, like you walk anywhere here in a Canadian forest and all you see are gigantic old stumps from, from when it was all logged as from the, and like they they took out all that old growth in the twenties in the like they they hit it hard 
yeah. and had no concern about the environment whatsoever. So they would, they would, uh, they would chop these little, um, wedges into the side of the tree and then they would climb up top of the wedge. They'd, they'd put boards into the wedges and then the, they would stand on two sides of the tree and they would run a great big saw back and forth. Yeah. Just sounds like an enormous amount of work. Then they would, they would cut the tree in a perfect way that it would fall over. And then they would, they would put the tree up on a, on a, they call it a steam donkey, but essentially they would lift it up on cables and then they would pull it out of the forest down to the rivers. And then they would run the trees down the rivers out into the ocean. And then they would collect them on the ocean to these giant log barges. And then they would either take them to a processing plant, cut them into lumber, or dry them out, whatever. And so you see the, the, just the shattered remnants of this everywhere. You're just walking through the forest and, oh, there's a steam donkey. You're walking through the forest and, oh, there's a giant tangle of steel cable. And everywhere you go, there are these just huge corpses of, of stumps that a hundred years later yeah. still haven't broken down. They're still there. You know, and they're, they have a tree growing on top of them, but they're still there. And, and one of the things that really gets me is we have sufficiently changed our environment that what was torn down will never grow again. One, one of the weirdest things to learn was earthworms are not indigenous to North America. I know. And, yeah. and so just the fact that we now have earthworms radically changes how forests grow. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, it's down at that level of invasive species changing everything. Yeah. Although, you know, when you think about, I mean, I think worms are, I mean, man, like this idea of invasive species is, is weird. Like in some yeah. cases there definitely are invasive species that cause a tremendous amount of harm and, and tend to dominate. But in many cases, these invasive species are, are there because there's a problem in the underlying environment. Like we have this thing called Scotch broom here that grows like crazy and covers any open chunk of land like this logged land with this these shrubs that are four to eight feet tall they block the ground for anything else but and but they are nitrogen fixers they restore the land quickly and as soon as trees start to grow they block the light and they die out and so they actually perform this function on the landscape that is better than any other native plant because they were never evolved to deal with logged land. Yeah. Right. And so he, none of our plants d really were, pre you know, evolved in an environment designed to restore. I mean, you've got fires, yeah. but in many cases with fires, the, the big trees would stand and mm -hmm. the, the underlying brush would get cleared out and then stuff would, would, you know, new trees would have a chance to grow in that. But, but you have these invasive species that can actually do a lot of help. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very weird, it's a very weird argument that's in the, um, in, in the various like restoration, like as I'm, yeah. you know, I'm now that I'm restoring this land, I'm learning a tremendous amount about land restoration and, that, and, and actually invasive species have place or not invasive but non-natives have their place yeah. in restoration where you have trees that are evolved to do very powerful fixes nitrogen fixing heavy metal accumulation things like that that you can plant and then they serve a purpose and then you hack them out and put in the native species yeah. once the job is done so anyway it's it's very interesting yeah so you were going to say something I, I just, I, I feel like that is one of the beneficial exceptions. And I just remember like growing up in New England, we had gypsy moths ruining the environment. We now have tent caterpillars here in the Midwest that were supposed to be a replacement for silkworms and instead are right. just destroying trees. And I hate stink bugs. Oh my God. We have stink bugs from Japan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We and, have them too. 
And like in the years, my husband was like, I don't even see why we need to uh, bring in someone to look at the apple tree. It's not going to produce good apples. And it's because of the stink bugs. Mm. And and so there's just like all these examples and Australia is full of them of of non-native things coming in and taking over the landscape. And there's a lot of efforts here in the prairie to try and figure out how to restore the prairie without buffalo, which isn't mm-hmm. working so well because turns out buffalo were kind of needed to maintain mm-hmm. the prairie. But I mean, aren't they, aren't they recovering? Like, aren't there tons of buffalo now? All in like small thousands of acre farms here and there. Yellowstone's doing pretty good, but it's not like you see wild buffalo in Kansas anymore. And um, all the land is designated now. So we have cougars, we have coyotes, we have, I've heard we have bear, but I haven't seen a bear. Um, Raccoons move in gangs. Um, but, But the high end massive animals just, aren't coming back in the areas that are still mm. populated by people. Yeah. The one that we have is, is or the one that we need more of is beavers. Yeah. Um, like when, like the Canadian and American landscape was dominated mm-hmm. by beavers. And they have this very special function where they lay down these dams and they trap water yeah. that that allows water to seep in more slowly into the landscape than than if without beaver dams. Yeah. And and so by killing the beavers, trapping them, killing them back in the 1800s, 1700s, yeah. they they wiped out tens of millions of beavers and totally changed the landscape from what it would would normally be, which is very much like ponds everywhere yeah. run by beavers. And <laughs> it when you walk outside even in like a park or whatever, you're not seeing what it used to look like. Yeah. Yeah. We need more beavers. We need a beaver core of engineers. A beaver core of engineers. Yeah. Yeah. I think I love that. That would be great. I'm, I've, I'm trying to, there's beavers sort of nearby me that have yeah. been, been, and I'm trying to entice them onto my land by planting food that they like. Yeah. Because I would... You know, I'm sort of imagining these series of dams and earthworks and stuff that I want to do to try and store the water. And and I'm like, man, but like just a, a family of beavers would, would get, yeah, yeah. Would get that job done for me overnight. And I wouldn't – and I'd be able to see beavers, which would be great. You should reach um, out to – wild... Don't take that out of context. Oh, Art. yeah. You should reach out to Wildlife Rescue Place and say, hey, my property is someplace you can rewild animals. That's a good idea. Hmm. I'll do that. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, that's great. I'm totally going to do that. Um, but you have a telecon and I have an interview. Yes. I've got an interview that I've got to do. Uh, very cool. I'm, I'm talking to a NASA researcher about trajectories, about mission trajectories, including how to rendezvous with an interstellar asteroid. So cool. I'm going to do that. All right. Well, thank you everyone for hanging out with us today. Thanks to everyone watching us on YouTube and on Twitch. Uh, all of the mods there. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks to everyone behind the scenes who works on our show. Thanks to the dogs barking in the background. And uh, 